Welcome to Talking in Stations. It's July 12th. I'm Matterall. We're going to go over war, industry, and peak concurrent user measurement to see if any of this stuff is all related. So with me to go through this are some heavy hitters. Uh, I'll start with uh, Ravendall. You know him from his website. How are you doing, Ravendall? Doing good. Thank you. He's an industrialist and made a great uh, tool. We'll talk about that tool later today. Uh, also with us is CSM member Kenneth. How are you, Kenneth Feld? How's it going this evening? I'm doing great. Good. Glad you could be with us. Uh, also from TIS crew, we have Nick Bison. Hey, thank you for having me on. Uh, was that heavy hitter thing a weight remark? <laughs> I don't <laughs> But uh, heavy, no, heavy hitter and then Nick. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know what? Rendell's making it uh, contagious to, like, uh, poke fun at you. All right. Well, Nick's with us. And also, Shen is with us, too. How are you doing, Shen? Doing well. Hello, hello. Good. We'll get Gregorn in here a bit later, talk a little more about war. First thing I want to go over, though, guys, is industry. Uh, maybe, Kenneth, you could give us an idea of... Uh, now, after the industry changes come in for a few months, what, what you're seeing out there? Kenneth. Oh, I think he has, he just lost power. He's in a hotel thunderstorm situation. So we'll give him a chance to come back. Revendal, uh, what's your website been looking like? because you opened it right about the same time that the uh, upgrade was coming. I remember you were building it, we were talking about it, and there it was, perfect timing, industry hits, industry changes hit, and your website comes up at the same time. Uh, what have you noticed, if anything? Ooh, what have I noticed? Um, I mean, nothing too specific. What I noticed was a really big hit, uh, of course, when it first really became public to everyone and got a little bit publicized. Um, Apart from that, what I do see is like a slow decline in the number of users that are using the website, I suppose. Though I don't at all know whether that is because, as we were talking about right now, we, we, that the PCU is going down a little bit, or if it is just simply because it's been longer since it has been uh, got a little promotion online. So that is, mm -hmm. could be either of those, I'm not sure. I'm afraid to hit on ravendal.com. Uh, Instagram. What's the website name? So that <laughs> RevWorks. I'll post it in the yeah, chat. Yeah, RevWorks. Well, the reason that we decided to look at this is because we were looking at battleship prices, and those things seem to be kind of coming back, you know, stabilizing. Yes. I mean, I kind of expected back. that, so. Yeah. For sure. Right. Because um, when you looked at it, there was an really large amount of um, value gained by doing the like base moon goo reactions, the R4 based moon goo reactions that are needed for the battleships uh, specifically. And that that's delta in price gain for those or value gain for those reactions or the profitability of it is certainly going down. And as a result, you'd expect that the battleships go down as well. Right. Kenneth, how you doing? Yeah, sorry about that little thunderstorm here and lights went out for a few minutes. Well, we're glad you're okay. Um, what have you noticed out there since, uh, basically since the industry changes uh, came and uh, have they, you know, are we stabilizing? Where are we at now? Uh, anything, T1 Battleship and Palo uh, has been dropping in price. Um, Battlecruiser and Palo has been dropping. It's been touching right about the place it was prior to the dev blog, uh, and actually even prior to start of the war. I think Feroxes are down to right around mid 50s or low 50 million each. Um, so Serbs, cruiser. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Serbs, which is a cruiser, is down to uh, 13, 14 million, I think, somewhere around there, which is numbers that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, battleships, long term have been dropping even after the 1v1 for battleships. There was a small spike there, but overall they've still, still been dropping. Uh, Ravendell just talked about it. Those reactions have been uh, 
hitting the market now and the core temperature regulators aren't nearly as bad as people thought they were going to be price wise. Um, there were so many people doing so many crazy things with pricing when the dev blog came out. And a lot of them I didn't say too much about. I've started correcting people now, um, but using perimeter for all this pricing stuff. And then the cost install was, you know, 50% of the ship price and people couldn't figure that out. So now that, now that people realize where you build matters and have adjusted accordingly, I think the prices have come down. Uh, capitals are still se severely upside down. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they're selling for half of build cost. And until we have a couple more YZ9s and M2 tax, um, big battles. And burn up. Right. Yeah. Big battles. Until we burn up, probably, I'd say 5,000 dreads, 5,000 carriers, and probably a couple hundred Titans and Supers. Uh, they're going to stay upside down. Yeah. Well, going to battleships, that was something that was contentious. A lot of people were saying battleships were going to get more expensive or be about the same, or they might actually get a little cheaper. I've looked at the Abaddon. That looks like it's under um, announcement time for this industry change like now. So it's actually cheaper than it was when they announced these changes. And I saw the same thing for the Hyperion. Yeah, yeah. but remember, they were inflated a little bit when the, when the dev blog came out, they were up in price. To give you an idea, the Ferox at the beginning of the war, basically a year ago, was about 50 million, 50, somewhere right around 50 million. Um, and the you have to look at the battleships back then. And then well, well Ferox is a battle cruiser, but yeah. Right. Well, that's what I mean. But you have to look at I'm gonna talk about battle cruiser because I know those numbers. Okay, go ahead. Um battleships followed the same type of path. So from a year ago, um, as the war went on and people were building dreads and, and titans and stuff to fight in the war, the price of minerals slowly crept up. And a ferox got up to about 80 million, which is about a 55% price increase, maybe 60%. Yeah, about 60% price increase. Um, so if you look at the same for a battleship, that's what it was about the time the dev blog came out. So just getting back to that price, although it's good, until you get back to the July of 2020 price, that's, that's going to be the real, real litmus test, right? And I don't know that they'll get down that low. But that definitely should get lower than what it was at dev blog time. Well, if I sure. look, if I look at Ferox 365 days ago, um, it looks like it was 50 million, 49 million. And now it's pretty much the same. It's 43 million Ferroxes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But Battleship, what was the Abaddon uh, 365 days ago? Okay, yeah, I, was still, I was still on the Ferox. The Abaddon, let's have a look at 365. Yeah, it's not there yet. Yeah, that, that's, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, 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 it's going to get close. I don't know. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I'm glad it got below the pre-dev blog price. That makes me happy. Yeah. Whether or not it'll reach all the way back that far, probably not. That's going to be a tough road to hoe. Um, but it should get it should get a lot closer. Definitely out of the realm of uh, all the chicken littles the day after the dev blog for sure. They're going <laughs> to yeah. be they're going to be more expensive, but they're going to be nowhere near the chicken little price that everyone thought they were going to be. Now, the, the faction battleships and faction cruisers, that kind of stuff, they're going to be a little spendy for quite a while, I think. It's going to take probably a few more months for them to fully settle out because there's a lot of moving parts there that are still getting in the supply chain. And a lot of guys in null sector hoovering them up before they get the JITA type thing. So... They're, they're going to be a little bit longer to settle out. But the, the Tech 1 battleships, non-faction variants, um, I'm, I'm very happy to see that they are dropping and, and hopefully they'll continue to drop a little bit more. Yeah, which I think is actually what you and Ravendall were both, uh, Ravendall with his website, was able to calculate that the, the battle sh battleships were kind of the 
break even point that things would be about the same at the battleship level. So battle cruisers should be cheaper after this patch. And yeah. then there was all the speculation and now things are settling out and now we're seeing that you guys were right. Uh, Ravendell, you uh, were you were looking at um your tool your uh website lets you break out uh stuff. Let me see if I can bring that up real quick. And where did you put that? I'll, I'll get to it in a second. Just uh, DM it to me and I'll put it up. But one, one second, I'm um, being interrupted here. One second. Uh, don't worry. Uh, I'll grab it. I mean, when the dev blog first came out and and it all all first hit TQ, I mean, there was there was quite a bit of manipulating and that kind of stuff at first. So it's been what two months now, a little over two months. Yeah. Uh, or a month and a half, six weeks. Yeah. So. And it's it's still very early on in the stabilization process. Right. Um, and once right now, no capitals are being built. Once the capitals start being built again in mass, it's gonna it's gonna reshape a lot of this stuff too. Um, you know, battle cruisers, battleships, that's the kind of stuff is gonna see more pressure. Um, and I would imagine that their price is gonna come up. A little bit, because right now nothing's using large amounts of minerals. Even though capitals don't use the minerals that they used to, they still use a lot, and those minerals aren't being used for that. So there's a lot of extra minerals on the market that once they start getting hoovered up for capitals, it'll put a fair amount of pressure on everything. Yeah. So, right, what was the question you had for me? Sorry. Oh, just uh, I was saying that you were right. What were some of the, uh, I mean, you basically were saying the same thing, that Battleship was about the break-even point uh, as far as the before and after this patch. We're now two months yeah. after that, and it looks like you were correct with yeah, the assessment. Yeah, so what I did at that, uh, that particular stream back then was that we looked at the amount of mining hours involved in building various things, right? Like the capitals, the battleships, and small stuff smaller than battleships. Mm -hmm. And when you looked at that and specifically looked at the amount of time uh, required to mining, uh, for mining to build a battleship, it was almost exactly the same. It's just that it was a little bit less minerals and a little bit more in the mungus. Right, which was really interesting because you were able to calculate the actual man hours of attention that you would have to give something. And that was a better calculation because we couldn't depend on the market at the time, right? It would be overinflated or underinflated. It was going to go crazy. And so your pricing wouldn't really make any sense until everybody kind of settled down and started selling their stuff. Yeah, out. exactly. Because I was like right at the moment that everybody was actively speculating because the patch, they knew the patch was going to hit, but it hadn't hit. And they knew it for like a month already. So yeah. So we're looking at a Raven and all the new build, uh, pieces that go into it. So, um, so Kenneth, you were saying earlier that the guys that are really hurting, and I've found this in my own experience because the people who comment on our YouTube videos are all saying, I, uh, I'm really disappointed I can't build that capital that I was building. Yeah, uh, and we knew that, that, I forget the guy's name that we talked to the first day, that it basically mined and built all his ships in EVE and he was still gonna go forward and, and try and build it. I forget which capital it was. He was gonna probably buy the gas, but but mine as much stuff as he can. Um, yeah, those people are gonna be, um, they're probably the most disenfranchised by the patch. I wish there was a way, but um, something else that, that I, and I did this from my research a little bit, you could start production and do, I think it was 16 days of training and build a Thanatos, right? That's that's almost nothing. But if you wanted to build a Harpy, a Tech 2 frigate, it took like 35 days of training. And that's just, it, it just doesn't seem right. It's upside down. And this patch kind of fixed that, but it also left a group of people uh, disenfranchised, I guess, for lack of a better word there. Um, and, and personally, I, those are the people that I, uh, that I felt for the most, but at the end of the day, 
it this patch needed to happen for for many reasons that i can't talk about but mm -hmm. um yeah it, well, it yeah. is what it is the, the patch certainly has put uh, more emphasis on well using the markets uh to, to get all your materials around which also i suppose um leads us into the well we don't want to change topic here but no, leads us into the um into the freighter ganking and all that sort of stuff ah yes that's where we we're going next the supply lines of the war uh we've noticed that um ganking is actually oh go ahead two points i'll bring, bring two points one is the yeah, uh, l ratio to uh for for faction battleships um yeah for so those things we're seeing uh their price is kind of plateauing uh they're, they're not growing anymore for a lot of them uh, part of the reason is there is a bottleneck in, at least in, for a lot of these pirate battleships uh, in NOSEC, in NPC NOSEC, that where we can trade them with ISK directly to a hull in, instead of trading for a BPC. Uh, so for that reason, um, for example, for the Sancha one, like because I, I live in Esoteria and right outside our doorstep is staying and then I know that the best. Uh, if you look at tree, uh, true creations as one of the essential corp, if you look at their buy price, uh, the nightmare hall is the second most valuable thing when compared to ISK, uh, ISK per LP ratio. So unless if you're going to do something to the LP store, their price is not going to go up that much higher compared to what it is right now. Yeah, I, I think we talked about the safety valve that LP store was going to provide um, the faction battleships that we were looking at. And that seems to have hit that safety valve pretty much. In other words, the LP store was another way you can get the same ship yeah. without having to build it yeah, and buy and the also, expensive BPO. Yeah, and also we can tell that it's traded for LP and not built directly by players is from the BBC price. So a nightmare BBC used to go about 350 million, and right now it's going under 100 million. So if there's more demand of the BBC, which means that people are building it more, then there should be a higher price for those BBCs. But what we are seeing right now is they're, the price of them are still going down, which means that people are not building it. They're trading it for ISK, uh, ISK for LP and uh, trading it directly on the market. Yeah, I mean, you can see it here. It's as low as 150 million, which is scandalously lower than it used to be. It used to be 400. Uh, so, yeah. All right, so those two things, just to... Uh, Shen wanted yeah. to comment on faction battleships. Uh, there's one more thing. It's like, uh, okay. I, I, I think I used to be... I think I was that person who, on the first day, uh, said, like, I actually built my first Orca and my first uh, Nethawker, my carrier. And uh, after the change, as a, like a person who builds uh, their own capitals, uh, I fully changed. Uh, I had, like I've rarely done any like building for anything that's bigger than a battle cruiser. Uh, if anything, I just build um, uh, modules for, for example, for my hell and for other ships. Uh, so the skill is not wasted uh, in, in in a sense where I can I still the skills required for those capital ship um, modules are the same as the capital ship. So I can still build those modules myself. Uh, but it, it basically changed a play style uh, where before I could uh, just rat a bit by those uh, small like um, die drawing or mechanic side uh, from uh, other players in OSEC, uh, switch to fully ratting. So I, I ran a go full ratting. Uh, little to no mining. If I do mining, it's just basically mining for ISK, not really to build anything. So that's how you adapted. It, it is a painful way, I would say. <laughs> like, I, I, I've i never thought of uh, myself that I would be like a professional rider. That's what I'm tell, saying to myself right now. Uh, but it is a reality. You have to change you with the game. All right. Yeah, and you mentioned Nightmare. Right now, the build price on a Nightmare is about 900 and 980 million. So with that soft cap or hard cap, depending on how you want to look at it, with ISK LP, um, yeah, it's going to be a while before any of them get built, most likely. 
Yeah, yeah. So, well, so that the, basically means like the, in, in, the GDA like, price is more. Sorry, the GDA price is crazy. I think this is not right. What did you say the uh, the build price is for a nightmare? Uh, nine eighty ish, somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just materials. That's not the BPC. Right. Yeah. That that doesn't include the beat. That's just to press the buttons. That doesn't include <laughs> hauling or BPC or anything. Yeah. Um, I don't know why the industry panel in the game has it at, and I think I'm in Jita, so it's like 1.7 billion. That's obviously wrong. Well, uh, cost index. It can, hold on, I'll look up Jita real quick and uh, it'll, this will open your eyes. Uh, what you're going to do is right click and then buy all and then see the. Oh, yeah, that's cost a, I didn't go through that last step. Let me try that one more time then. So I'll go to the nightmare. I'll look up the information on it. How did you get that big? Go to industry, then go to view in industry. If I right click on the blueprint and in here, I can see the estimated price, but that may not be accurate. If I click on that and select buy all, this gives me a real working price. Well, so you'd have to, um, when you look at the straight up materials of the BPC, you have to look at, uh, uh, the difference between two things, right? Because there's like the the materials to do the whole chain and do your own reactions as well mm. um, before you build the, the nightmare, or there's the materials that you need to just straight up go to Jita, buy all the materials and build it right there. Yeah. Um, if you do that, then it's going to be another 300 or something million higher. Not that 1.7 billion I just saw on the stream, yeah, yeah. but it's going to be more like 1.3-ish billion in materials instead of the 900 something. If you do some of the labor the, the yourself. temperature regulator is a big one right now. They're they're significantly overpriced. So if you buy the the blueprints for that and the parts, you can save a couple hundred million just right off the bat. Yeah, this thing is. Um, but you have to compare like so if you buy everything from Gila, then you, there's no hauling involved, and uh, if if you do reactions and gather materials, let's say in Nostec or in Lowsec, there's a lot of logistic behind moving those stuff, mo moving the yeah. final product to Jita and sell them. For sure. That's of course also what makes it more profitable, uh, but yeah, that's for sure, that's correct. Mm -hmm. well, all this to say those faction battleships uh, are still over expensive compared to buying it straight out of the LP store. So players that used to build their own faction battleship might rat instead because they could just buy the lp cheaper does that sound fair yeah and like well, compared to you... what it cost and uh, what what i can get from ratting is way more effective or more way more efficient for my time to to rat than mine okay rav we gonna say uh, something well you can't really buy LP, right? Or am I missing something? Um, it just it just means that the LP is essentially more valuable for doing that channels, thing. I think there's there's channels where there's LP for sale, and think, you can buy it in that manner. Yeah. Oh, right, from other people. Yeah, player to player buying contracts. Yeah, so like Concord LP, you know, to get the blueprints for the the Concord Mado modules and stuff. You know, I'll put one to buy four million Concord LP, paying seven seven hundred and fifty ISK for LP, and then someone messages me, and I give them a list of what I want them to buy. They go buy it, send me out a contract, and then I, you know, then they get paid for it. Right. There's an indirect way of you. Okay, an indirect way of buying LP. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, what it boils down to, I think, in general. In essence, is that it used to be that the faction battleships um, were mainly determined, price was mainly determined on the availability of the BPCs and the cost to build that because the build cost was really cheap because it was essentially the same as just a normal Tech One battleship. Um, and now the, the main price determinant of a faction battleship is, for a large part, the LP uh, cost, I suppose, and the other, the faction warfare way of getting it, essentially. Okay, uh, so Rav brought up something that was uh, we were going to go to next, and that was some of the stuff that's been going on um, 
Well, first, let's wrap this section up, actually. Let me just wrap this up. So prices are kind of doing what these guys predicted, which is everything battleship and below is kind of stabilizing. Faction battleships are having their release valve uh, triggered in that you can buy them through LP stores. So we really figured that the faction battleship is going to land at about one billion each or over one billion. Um, and that's kind of where they're at. Uh, so all the stuff that you guys said is really coming true. Uh, the only thing that is not is, or not, not that it's not coming true, but that the only group that's really hurting right now is the people who wanted to build capitals. And that was pretty much by design. The small guy that wanted to build his own capital, there's, there's the real pinch of the changes that have happened. Okay, so that's the industry part. Um, the other part of this was war. How is this affecting the war? Let me actually, uh, at this point, bring in Gregorin if he's still there. And um, there we go. Welcome, Gregorin. So, okay, hi, Gregorin. So we're just about to talk about the war and how logistic lines are being challenged right now because we've got to a point where the Imperium has essentially lost their territory and is down to uh, a citadel. Let's call it a citadel, right? The whole constellation is like a giant walled citadel. And that's where they're at. And they are being sieged or blockaded by Pappy, who's sitting outside their walls. And uh, a little bit of skirmishing going back and forth. So the war has shifted to logistic lines because in order to create a siege situation, you kind of have to starve the city out. Is that even possible in EVE Online? It is very difficult because of how hard it is to catch jump freighters. Okay. Uh, and we can see the jump freighters actually aren't being killed that often. But what, what are they killing in the backfields and why would it make a difference? Well, Pappy mentioned the suicide ganking group which uh i uh, i haven't joined because that's not an activity which i i'm particularly interested in right now i believe it's run by manfred sidious though uh my guess is that to, i haven't joined their channels but it would make sense to to target people who have been identified as Imperium alts trying to make money in high sec. Like if I was to organize a suicide ganky operation, I would particularly focus on uh, routes between the incursion focuses. Right. Routes between yeah. incursions. Hmm. I, don't, I don't personally know if like they have sp specifically targeted the Imperium uh, trading alt corporations or logistics corporations but i do know that they at least keep a um li a blue list of friendly uh Pepe alliance uh alt corporations to make sure they don't kill their own guys exactly that's probably a lot easier to find out too right right I hope so. <laughs> i well. know that when a former member of my corporation was running a suicide ganking sig in pandemic horde actually we had him on as a guest uh back in november or so uh he, they had a requirement that they must have at least one pandemic horde character in each suicide ganking fleet in addition to the their alt alliance for the for the sig because in order to check standings of for who they were targeting oh that's interesting Although so that suicide, yeah, that SIG is no longer active, though. But this new SIG seems to have a similar policy then. Well, do you know anything about their success rate or? Uh... No, I, I haven't followed this suicide ganking group. Kenneth, you're aware of this, right? You're in PanFam. Is there... Um... Has there been a shift in strategy to start trying to take out freighters and jump freighters? Or freighters, yeah, you, mostly? You know I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> um, I, I can tell it's, you that uh, it, that would be a natural progression in the war for either side to uh, to want to starve the enemy. And uh, the fact that they're doing it or 
or talking about doing it or however you want to phrase it would be absolutely normal and expected. Okay. In other words, it's obvious. Like a about yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's obvious. Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, I, I don't, uh, I'm not going to talk about who's in charge or anything like that, but to think that we wouldn't do it is probably uh, overlooking uh, something. Well, early on, if you look at the nature of the war, and it makes a lot of sense that Pappy was focused on doing a lot of the war inside a fountain, Quarius, period basis, all these areas around Delve. And in Delve itself, that was the war to them. They were demolishing structures and, and fighting fleets. Um, but I didn't hear a big deal about hitting logistic lines. You did hear Imperium's perspective on that was, yeah, we're hitting uh, Pappy logistics uh, lines, and you should count that when you're talking about how much damage they're doing to our structures. You should count how much damage we're doing to their supply lines. And they were, uh, I think, trying to count in how much their freighter damage they were doing. And they were doing a lot of damage to freighters. I don't know if they were Pappy freighters. They claim it, they were. Pappy wouldn't say if they were or weren't. Uh, but Goonswarm does a lot of ganking. Yeah, one of the big suicide ganking multi-boxers is Kusion, who is, his ganking alt corp is in Goonswarm as well as his main. And he's been active long before the war. Has He's been a big ganker. There, there's other groups that do it that are a lot more quiet about things and the way they go about things, but are, are just as effective. Oh, you think so? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. All right. One so of the interesting connections to suicide ganking is that if you look at it, the, the original volume of empires of Eve, w one of the sources that they credit for a, that a lot of the information that he that he had was the founder of code hmm. although he is referred to as goon swarm historian in that in that book uh yeah i i know of him but uh, i didn't know he was a historian um okay so anyway the well, Go ahead. Can one of one of the one of the co-founders of the Freight Club is in PL now too. So, I mean, there's 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 plenty to go around. Right. Anyway, the point is, uh, logistic lines are being hit, maybe at a higher rate than they were before on the Pappy side, uh, and um, we don't know what kind of damage they're doing. But it's interesting because their 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 horns are locked around one DQ. Uh, it really is an attempt to kind of, I would think, a, an attempt to starve out, um, the, you know, uh, the Imperium, because their options are limited in other ways. And now, by taking away a lot of the resources that they don't have plentiful amounts of, you could actually start to hurt them uh, in other ways. Uh, that yeah. brings me to to test. Or go ahead. What were you going to say, Gregorian? Yeah, I I think it's probably a more, would be more important to target the individual line members money money making in high sec than to target the stockpiles because it's unlikely that those stockpiles would be depleted soon and you could probably deplete people's wallets faster well yeah i'm not saying they're targeting star um stockpiles they probably have a ton of stockpiles inside of uh, 1dq itself it's more the uh, additional things that they need that they would need to get from the market. That's what I figure. And that probably is hitting the individual who's probably moving his own stuff for his, yeah. for his corporations. The, the focus on individual members is why I said I would probably, if I was running suicide ganking ops, t base it around people moving between one incursion focus to the next. All right. Um, the other thing is... Who controls mining now in Delve? Has have there been mining fleets? Have those stopped? Is Test um, well, running the Locust fleet at all? Or well, Pappy ran a joint uh, coalition Locust fleet in Iridia over the weekend. Mm. That's not Delve, but uh, yeah, one, it's one next to Delve. 
I think they're just waiting for a lot of the polls in Delve to finish yeah. up. Yeah, it sounded like they have a lot more moons scheduled, and I would assume that since I've I've scanned some of the moons in Delve and Aquarius, that some of those would be on the moon. I assume that some of those will be on the schedule. Okay, so we assume that's going to happen sometime soon. Uh, Kenneth, is that significant? Like um, running a, oh, lo- yeah, I mean, a locust fleet? Yeah, we're sitting in Fortress Delve, drinking beer while they're stuck on their front porch staring at us. We're pissing in their yard and eating their raspberries <laughs> off their bushes and not not their tomatoes and. Uh, you know, uh, basically living it up out here. And, uh, you know, they're stuck in their house. We're swimming in their pool and, you know, having a good old time. And if they're okay with that, then, hey, I guess they're okay with that. You know, I'll crash on their front yard for a long time. I like your down-home description of it. (laughs) But uh, basically, you're living in their space is what you're saying. And you're going to eat well, we're from their living garden. In our space too. Yeah, we still have all our space that we're doing whatever we want to in. Yeah. And then we have their space to, you know, hey, you know the uh, what's it? You never crap in your backyard, crap in someone else's backyard. So it's like we're going over there and we're making a big old mess. You don't have to bag your crap there. Nothing. You just leave it on the front lawn, and uh, you know, oh someone else will take care of it later. And one of the interesting things is that the Fortizar, which has been the staging point for Iridium Mining Ops, was owned by Original Sinners. But for obvious reasons, it, it's now owned by Pandemic Horde. Oh, did they? Sorry, did they transfer it or take it? Uh-huh. Yeah, they, it was transferred. Okay. And inter- the really interesting thing about that Fortizar is that at the beginning of the war, that was uh, NSH's staging Fortizar for their de- war deployment. And then the report, reportedly the destination of original sinners is NSH. Right. That's where they may end up. Um, okay. So funny enough, the, uh, all this, um, first of all, we covered industry and how industry is getting to the point where it's being normalized. And then we talk about uh, how the war has actually shifted to affect industry and supply lines and to destroy as much as possible the uh, one side or the other's ability to recreate their ships uh, so they can continue to fight. Although they're not losing stuff really quickly now, that'll be a big problem in the future. And we were wondering, like, does this does any of this tie into the PCU? Is there some connection between uh, industrial or industrial players that used to build capitals just not logging in, or are there miners that are not logging in to do any mining because they either can't or they don't want to? They're not incentivized to, and that's some of the stuff that we were looking at. Uh, I think we we kind of came to the conclusion that, as Kenneth was telling us that. Um, you can run jobs quickly and your characters don't have to stay on very long, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, Like, I spun up my first uh, dedicated industry alts over, well, starting in at the beginning of the year. And I have a couple now. And I generally don't keep them logged in for very long. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the part of industry of just logging in, tossing a job in and going away. The resource gathering side is the folks who may, and I'm probably a good example, uh, you know, of I can't gather what I used to, so I've adjusted how much I'm on until I can figure out how to, how to make it work again. So it's, it's the smaller entities that may not be logging in as much from the high sec side. Yeah, and yeah, I'm... I mean, you... yeah. Uh, go, yeah, go I'm... Kenneth, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm just saying, you can toss in five or 600 jobs in 15 minutes with no problem. So there is there is absolutely no reason that a pure industry alt should be logged in for 
any more time. Now, if I'm talking about in a corp environment, if you're doing it individually, then maybe you stay logged in a little bit more. But anyone who has an alt corp that does it, your your manufacturing alts are logged in for maybe 15 minutes. And then if you put on four day jobs, you'll never see them again for four days. Um, your PI alts and mining alts are the ones that are most affected. And if you're talking about the PCU, look at Delve. We're sitting on their front lawn mining their fruit trees and garden that they built. And uh, what are all the goon miners doing right now? That's where you really need to start looking at the PCU. If you went through Delve prior to us invading a year ago and look at all those workers that they're out there and stuff, where are all they? Where are all those pilots at? Um, there's no chance they could be in uh, mining in high sec, for instance, something like that. Yeah, they they like to say that they they make a, you know, a lot of money mining and running incursions in high sec. Yeah, but not all those alts. There was a ton. Uh, I guess I'll bring another perspective into this, which is the PCs that are going down, the people who are taking a break, are the consumers. So the mineral scarcity really uh, changed the behavior of a lot of miners, while the industrial pack, uh, that, that update really changed the consumers a lot. Like, right? For them, the prices of a lot of, let's say, capital ships, uh, that once once where their goal for for a long time in their Eve career has now uh, the price of them has skyrocketed for like double or triple their price, right? So those are the people who are really uh, get getting disappointed by by seeing the price in in the contracts. Hmm. Yeah, like I have a dr dreadnought alt that I have very very little use of right now in the current stage of the war i basically only log that character in because sometimes i use it to move a set of eyes somewhere and, and so that's not counting toward the pcu as much as when i was joining a lot of capital fleets with the character a few months ago and i'm sure that's uh, that i'm not the only one like that I'm trying to get up the uh, 1DQ's 7.6%. That's kind of, the, it looks like about the same size or a little bit bigger, 7.0%. It's kind of, uh, T5 and 1DQ kind of have the same industry uh, system cost index. Part of that is you do have to keep in mind that because 1DQ's uh legacy for Ortizar was uh, the Amar one. Uh, they ha they have that affects their index be because they that. have the special system upgrade because of what their faction Fortizar was. All right. So now let's look at the last thing, which was the PCU. We were talking about that just now. Here's some uh, some stuff that you, I don't know if you could see this. Let's have a look at it. Yeah, we have some different stats here that, that we're used, you're probably not used to seeing. Uh, one of them is, uh, and this is for two months going back to mid-May, which is kind of where we pegged the beginning of the PCU decline. Uh, if we look at the PCU decline, it starts about May 18th, it's in the middle of May, basically. And there's a few things that happened at that time. One was uh, you had um, basically the last of the structures were destroyed in Delve around mid-May. Uh, you also had, I think the last Asbel attempt was uh, uh, tried around that time, mid-May. So the war has kind of come to a stalemate. That's says something that's just a data point um in real life you had on that may 13th uh you had cdc say and this is the american uh, disease control center basically said you don't have to wear masks anymore and then within the next week uh cities not cities but states started to kind of say okay well you don't need to take you don't need to have your mask on anymore and that is what we could mark as the beginning of the reopening of a lot of post 
or the beginning of post COVID as far as isolation goes. So people are going to want to get away from their computers or go and do something else. And yeah. that happened. And then there's summer in general as well. And summer is a big one. And kind of May, I think, is the beginning of of when people consider uh, what people consider summer, right? Like vacations begin, and uh, I think there's some holidays in there. And then you have also some competition in real life with other games. You have uh, World of Warcraft has an expansion on the uh, 16th, I believe, and um, Final Fantasy. Is it Final Fantasy? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Far. Final Fantasy had something, and then. Um... Yeah. Elder Scrolls had something too. Yeah, one other game had something. Yeah, Elder Scrolls, yeah. And so, yeah, Memorial Day is kind of what we mark as the beginning of summer. So there's a lot of factors at work here. And the starkest thing we see is the uh, PCU, that's peak concurrent users, uh, dipping pretty hard. Everybody's concerned about that, right? Because it's like, hey, these are simultaneous players. That means the world will feel less full. It's, been, it's lower than we've seen it in a long, long time. But if you look at ship kills and pod kills here, uh, these kind of work together. Um, yeah. Yeah, what you can see really nicely on the graph is that it all seems to mimic each other in the same trend. Um, what you do see is that the player counts, uh, when you look at it at the start of that period, it was about 30,000. Right now it's about 20,000. Um, that is like a decline of about, well, about a third. And while well, you see a similar decline and trend line for the other factors, it is not quite as large. Um, the number of jumps, it basically mimics it. But like the, NPC, the number of NPC kills went down 15% roughly instead of 30% with the player count. So it seems that either people per person, more people are ratting, or it's something else that, um, that explains that. What you do see also is the similar thing is, yeah, just the activity on a whole on this graph it is quite well displayed that it's gone down a little bit and it doesn't seem to be too obvious that it is just one side of the activity that's thrown down right so you see these widespread indicators there's definitely a downturn it uh to me it just doesn't look as sharp as uh the population um but it, there is a downturn Yeah, some people seem to have a vested interest in making it out to be worse than it actually is. It's certainly not good, but it feels like some people are trying to make it seem worse for some sort of propaganda. Uh, are there any political goals to saying that the PCU is bad? Like, what what kinds of narratives are there? There's a common to? narrative that. Pappy is killing the game with the war and needs to end it for the end the war for the sake of the game. Well, also look at, uh, you know, the the original Summer of Rage. Guess what? We're all going to quit. We're all going. You're doing it wrong, and TCU is going to drop, and CCP knuckled under. That's what they're hoping for, perhaps. I mean, this is the lowest we've seen since 2006. So this is even low, lower than, I think, Blackout. Uh, blackout. Um, I think it happened 2019, 20, I think, something around that time. 2019, so, October. Or yeah. June. I mean, the number is going towards the uh, Serenity way, which is about 10K PC, PCU, uh, something like that. So we have to wait and see. Like, our hope right now as... I think all of us are, which is uh, when fall comes in, when summer ends, maybe the number's going to rise back up. Uh, the number will not stay as this. Like we're, our hope is the people who are taking, who are leaving, they're taking a break. They're not actually abandoning this game. Right. Okay. So one last, yeah. oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that it is, um, it, it, it's, it's, all of those factors we talked about earlier combined to in, in larger and smaller levels, right? Like it is both the COVID related aspect opening up a little bit. It is both that the war is slowing down. It's probably also a little bit industry changes and mining and related stuff. It's all of those. And it's really hard to tell, okay, which one of this, which one of these is the really big determinant one. Is it the summer? Is it the, the one of those other ones? It's hard to tell. 
Uh, what is likely, though, is that, in my eyes anyway, is that that will end, um, end eventually again when the season goes out. But that's my guess, I suppose. Yeah. One thing that I was looking at I thought was kind of interesting was that the the uh, the time zones seem a lot flatter. Might be my imagination, but usually you see a huge peak for Eastern um, uh, European time zone with the overlap of the uh, United States time zone, uh, and then what that looks like in comparison to uh, Australian time zone, which is later, and it just seems a lot flatter than it used to be. Which I think uh, at least on the war front. Yeah. On the, uh, what do you think? Your experience or something different? Uh, so on the war front, like we are actually assembling a standing fleet for AOTZ in Dell. Uh, so a cooperation, I guess, with us and Fraternity. So you have guys on. So, so there will, be, yeah, we will we'll have PUP on in Dell uh, as a part of the I think daily things, put more pressure on their AOTZ. Uh, but uh, from what I've seen. Uh, the, the number at least, uh, like the number has been dropping, at least for AOM since after we moved to Esoteria from Omist. Mm -hmm. uh, so during a move uh, from one region to other, another, you tend to lose a lot of people. That's part of uh, what you have to expect, right? When fraternity moved from OS uh, to Vail, they lose, I think, 200, 300 players. And same thing for us. There's a lot of people here who are lost. And our goal right now is trying to get them back uh, to see what their needs and uh, to try to fulfill their needs as an alliance, at least. Uh, but from the game side, there's really nothing that, at least from what I'm seeing, that's going to attract players uh, back at, least at the moment, right? Uh, like all these industry changes, uh, People, some people say it's good for the game. Some people say it's bad for the game. But at least from, let's say, a day-to-day -day player perspective, it is really hard for them, I would say, uh, for their writing, for their goals in game, and stuff like that. Right. Okay, so uh, again, if we look at the uh, the drop uh, after mid-May, uh, it seemed to be going pretty pretty straight except these last two weeks it looks like it's kind of leveling off now it may be an optimistic view but it, it does look like uh, we've hit kind of a bottom and uh just cross our fingers for that but you can see one week was uh deeper than the one before and so uh, until you know that trend tends to break right right at july 4th so we'll yeah. see what's going but on you do, what you do see on that graph you're showing right now about the pcu Mm -hmm. is that there seems to be like a definite kink there's something that changed all of a sudden right mm -hmm. and it's and it's not it's it's later than the industry patch release on its own so yeah my guess as a result would be that that is at least not the immediate factor because why would there be a delay of like a month or more uh, between the industry patch releasing and then pcu dropping right That's, and scarcity uh, wasn't just the industry patch it was even before that right i mean scarcity has been around a while now yes 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 that's true so this isn't a scarcity drop uh and there's just indications that there are a number of things which is what we've said this isn't one thing it's a number of things coming together and i wouldn't call it a perfect storm it's just layer upon layer of um, things that are happening game changes but also seasonal seasonal times which are very regular and uh, also alternatives to playing eve online have made it so that people and, and also the composition of players that are playing now is different than it was before and so all these things are part of what we would consider uh, uh, tre the trend making factors Okay. Anybody else got anything on that? All right. Well, that brings uh, also, us. I, I also Go ahead, Chad. See the final result in fall. In fall, like if the number actually comes back up, or it's, it's going to plateauing, or it's going to keep going down, uh, I think time will tell the truth at the end. Yeah, Rav and uh, Kenneth, you guys both kind of pointed this out that, uh, especially Kenneth, there was. Next year, next MER will be June, and we should be seeing that pretty soon because usually falls in the middle of the next month. 
So we're expecting the MER from June. That's going to tell us some uh, more stuff, isn't it? Cause and effect wise. Oh yeah, for sure. Cause you'll get the mining numbers from June and that's right now, if the drop off started in mid May, you know, you've got the CDC, you've got the post patch deal, you know, so there's a lot of things coming together there. And, and if you look at the mining numbers, they, they had just started to tail off. So you could, you could, if you looked at them, you could rack that up to, you know, just whatever. But June will be the first full month where we get to look at the mining numbers. And so you can compare them to March, April, May, June, and see how much was mined. If all of a sudden there's 30% less mining, 30% less people logged in, well, you know, that's that's a pretty easy pair of dots to connect, yep. right? So the same thing for ratting risk. You know, if ratting risk is down 20%, well, then people are chaining, trading, mining for ratting to a certain degree as well. Um, well, and, and and that could all be down to pricing or where they live. You know, high sec versus low sec versus null sec versus ratting, and what's more profitable for them type thing. Yeah, I mean, with mining, um, if the mining numbers are down thirty percent and the PCU is also down thirty percent, then you'd assume that one to one, you know, the people that are not playing right now is a whole more it's like a homogeneous set of the whole of the whole population right it's not specifically one type of subgroup of the population that seems to be less active right now um which in my mind would then indicate that it is an outside effect with lockdowns related and seasons related that sort of stuff if it turns out that like one particular niche like mining or ratting or something else has a much larger drop than the than the PCU drop, so much larger than thirty percent. Then you would wonder, like, hey, it is this kind of subgroup that is having it really hard right now, and that's causing the player um, activity to be lower. I want to show you guys one more thing. Uh, I thought this might be fascinating for you, and that is, uh, I made this graph, and I haven't finished it. It's part of a research that I'm doing to kind of talk about scarcity in an, an intelligent way, uh, cause and effect kind of thing. And this is um, ratting only, so this is not mining, but I wanted to point out some things to people, I'll make it so that you guys can see it, but uh, I can maneuver as well. In 2014, I have it off the graph here. Um, well, let's just say between 2010 and 2015, it just, which is what we're looking at right about here, the 1 trillion mark was kind of where ratting was, and it was very, very flat. It was, you know, up and down, just like these other ones down here, very, very flat. And then uh, around 2014, you had soft system change, and the players decided they were going to say, this is what we want. So they created this null deal where the players spoke out about what they wanted, and they wanted to um, benefit from a density of people in small spaces. Uh, basically, uh, well, I'll read what they wrote here. We would like to see the value of individual systems increased to support a dense ecosystem of player. And uh, a, a few months later, they got that actually with Parallax. Uh, that was the expansion. And here's the wording on that. Increase potential population density of upgraded systems. Compress the gap in the in-system quality between higher and lower true sec systems so that the lower value systems become more attractive than they currently are. And this is the beginning of being able to upgrade your territory in order to rat better and mine better. Couple with that, I'll go through this really quickly. Ishtar changes, VNIs, um, you had carriers uh, change their fighters uh, to tube fighters basically, and they became easier uh, to work with. You start to see a trend line of that uh, ratting we presume in null sec go up. And uh, here skill extractors and injectors are introduced and then there's just an explosion. Uh, as you can see, the climb, 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 climb of uh, income. Look at everything else, all the other stuff, totally flat, all okay. But you have this distortion that has started and it ends here in uh, middle of 2017 where CCP Quant famously basically said on Reddit, Hey, you guys, don't attack the dev team. They're trying to uh, control the amount of money that you guys are making. And he put out this theoretical 
amount and people just booed him off the stage, uh, booed, not booted, basically saying like, oh, that's an outlier and that's not something that is typical. And so your, your CCP is basically um, going to nerf our PVP because they're going to nerf the fighters and you're going to nerf that to control a PVE problem. Well, that's not our PVP problem, so don't do that. Well, they did anyway, and you can see it had some kind of effect. Um, but, and here's where I have to do some more digging is to figure out what caused, uh, there might be more people at this point that got into the business of ratting with supers and you see it go up and up and up and really gets going around 2019, the beginning to the end of 2018 and 19. Well, this is war territory. That's probably why it's down. But by the end of the war, uh, the 2018 wars, you see it just spike as people come back after a war and do what? They rat, and they're doing it in supers. And uh, and here you could see, like, they were definitely making some strides to reduce um, that. And uh, right around in June, there's another war campaign uh, that the Imperium goes on, and they're a big part of this budget, this, this graph, basically, because they're the ones that were doing a ton of this ratting uh, underneath the super umbrella. And then blackout hits and just stops it. Uh, knocks it way down, even below its usual one trillion. And the 66 days of uh, blackout are right here. Uh, and then once they lift blackout, it really kind of goes back to its pre-blackout number until right about here is when they change it with the ESS uh, upgrade and bounties get counted in a different way. So the accounting just basically gets thrown off. But I wanted to show you that um, if we look at it, you can see why there was a problem, right? Like where ratting was down here, jumps up to here, stays there for about two years. Uh, blackout affects it. That's the only thing that really dramatically stops it. And then the ESS kind of comes back and brings an end to it. Uh, and uh, higher brand says don't discount CCP's botting efforts uh, in the chart. Okay, I don't really know how to tie those in. We can look at security reports and see how that works, and that might account for some of these valleys up here. I don't know, uh, but I don't see any trend where where bots. I mean, uh, if you count blackout as an anti-bot measure, which it definitely was, yeah, that did a huge dent into the botting problems, but. I'm going to go back and do some more historical work on this to find out what's what. But I wanted to show that to you guys uh, as a preview because we're talking about industry today. Okay. Uh, you guys got anything else before we go? Thanks for hanging around. Yeah, one thing we did talk about kind of pre-show that we didn't really touch on yeah. is uh, jump freighters. If you go to Jita right now and you look at the total number of jump freighters for sale, it is a very, very small portion of what used to be. And with the exception of the Anshar being just slightly below build price, um, the Nomad is slightly above build price, but the Arc and the Rhea um, are actually decent profit now. Uh, that's the first capital that's start to, starting to come in line, although that was the capital that was messed with the least. Um, in the build process, it's still, you know, two months, two and a half months, whatever it is, uh, they're starting to, to not be upside down anymore. So uh, the other stuff should be following along uh, once enough of them die. And, you know, right now there's just so many dreads and carriers and facts and stuff in, in stockpiles. It's going to take massive, massive fights to get us to that point. Yeah. Well, am I looking at the right one? Yeah, Jump Freighters, Nomad. You mentioned something else. Why is the Rhea the most popular with a Nomad, second most popular Jump Freighter? Uh, well, it comes down to two things. The Rhea holds the most, um, but it also uh, uses the most fuel. But at the end of the day, if you're hauling the, a lot of stuff, Rhea's always tend to work out better. Now there's the, the 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 duct tape guys, man. They stand by their nomads. <laughs> They'll die on the hill every day, twice on Sunday. Um, mimitars. The, yeah, the the yeah the duct tape mimitar nomad guys. Uh, the bale and twine is is holding that stuff together, but um they 
carry the least amount, uh, but they also use the least amount of fuel. So they're all like, oh, my efficiency. Well, yeah, that's fine until you got to move 750,000 uh, cubic meters. And my two RIAs can make that in one jump and you have to send the third Nomad along. All of a sudden your efficiency ain't that great. So it, it all depends if you're doing this on a small scale or a large scale as to which one is better. And the, the, the Anshar and the Arc, I guess that's just for people who, you know, weren't smart enough to train the right jump freighters <laughs> from the beginning. Or, uh, or it's the cheaper version. Yeah, Arc has better armor. Like that. Arc has better armor, but you'll never use yeah. because if you're in a situation where your Arc needs to defend itself through tanking, you're gone. They, they all have their tank in their hull. Yeah, the, the hull hit points are massive compared to everything else. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I kid make fun, but I mean, that that's the reality of it is, you know, guys, guys fly arcs and anchars because that's what they trained for whatever reason. Uh, but the, the guys who do logistics hardcore are uh, pretty much Rhea and Nomads for for the aforementioned reasons. Yeah. Uh, Rhea holds the most, Nomads the most efficient, and that pretty much sums it up right there. Um, you were saying uh, there's just uh, not uh, uh, one second. There, you were saying uh, there's just not that many jump freighters on the market right now. Yeah, there's there's probably there's been between twenty and thirty five consistently now for the past couple of weeks. Um, whereas before there'd be hundreds, um, and I would imagine that's due to all the ganking. People are getting ganked. They're buying more. And, uh, you know, people just aren't building them to replace them because it takes all the new materials now. So they're going to have to get to a point where it's profitable to build them and profitable to sell them. Once it does, then then they'll start building more. How much of the total jump freighter trade is on markets rather than people buying in directly from a contract from a person in a null sec staging area or something like that. Yeah, I have no idea of that breakdown, but yeah, I've, I've never sold one in Jita. Um, I've never bought one in Jita either for that matter. But uh, you know, the, the big null sec alliances, I would imagine. And, and this could be the flip side of that, right? It could be that most people used to get them that way, but now the null guys aren't building them either. And so they have to go to Jita to buy them, and that's why Jita is running low. Hmm. Yeah. Um, right now, for my well, with my personal process, um, the the jump freighters are still less profitable than most Tech Two hills um, in profit margin, like the percentage profit you'll make. Which, given the amount of effort that you need to do to build a jump freighter with building a capital and then building a capital on top of the freighter, essentially, um, makes it not worth yet to build them. But if the prices go up a little bit, or if, like some of the nil blocks, you have access to a hell of a lot of um, R4 Mungu already that's underpriced and you don't know what to do with, then yeah, I suppose building jump freighters right now is uh, is a good thing to do. For is me, that, it probably needs to go up a little bit more. Is that what's in a jump freighter? Is the R4 moon materials? Um, well, mainly because, well, partly because of a Charon. Um, for example, the Charon is needed to build a Rhea, and a Charon is a capital ship. And uh, the capital ships always require quite a lot of the R4 Mungu. Um, the capital core temperature module is what uses a ton of R4. Yep. But, and, but Rhea's in general, the Tech 2s, in general, use a ton of moon goop because they're Tech Two ships, so they and they always have. But what right. got added was that capital core temperature module, which right. uses a ton of R four. Yep, and Araya actually uses two, if I remember correctly, one for the freighter and then another one for making it a jump freighter. They, they... What was that? The, the jump freighter requires one, so Nomad Arc. Uh, Anshar, they all require two. One to build the freighter, one to build the jump freighter. Right. All right. And, yeah, and uh, also okay. why people choose, like, say, Arc or Anshar. I want to read at least what I know of, like, for AOM, all of our jump uh, uh, jump freighter pilots, we use Arc because you can, um, you, you can mine the ice locally. 
So that makes it much cheaper and much accessible for those jump freighter pilots to to, to get the fuel that they needed to 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 jump. And also, Arc looks the best. I think. <laughs> yeah, Arc does look the best. That's why I fly them. They look the best. I didn't pay attention. Yeah, to Yeah, that's why the first freighter I trained was the Providence, because I it it's looks scary. best. Well, you know, it's an emotional game. What can you say? Uh, plus, this looks like the Star Wars uh, carrier coming off a of Hoth, right? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, so there you have it. We talked about uh, some of the uh, economy seems to be returning back to normal. Battleship and under T1 hulls. Those were the things that were kind of um, people worried about battle cruisers and battleships. That looks like it's going to kind of end up being about the same as it was before, if not cheaper. Uh, people who are small time builders that were building capitals, you're actually hurting these days. Uh, unfortunately, there's really no relief in sight for you at this moment. Yeah, when I spun up my first industry alt, uh, I had just gotten the capital building skills trained when the industry changes were announced. Yikes, good timing. It happens. So I immediately just start, decided I just focused on T2 production rather than capital production. Oh, T2, uh, T2 production certainly seems to be going strong still. And uh, Yeah, it's, I I, I've been making a decent profit off of that. Right. And uh, in summary, again, the uh, stuff that we we're talking about with the war, supply lines being hit, ships like this, uh, freighters uh, being attacked since the blockade is in full swing. And um, it's really kind of a race for supplies. And you see that Pappy has advantages here because they can do locust fleets uh, and they can basically mine all these moons. Um, and if and if they do a locust fleet, that means basically they do it all at the same time, and then they put a fleet together to protect that, and then it becomes an interesting proposition. Will that fleet get attacked? And if it does, uh, will it turn into to a big fight? So we may see something happen there. And, uh, and then we also looked at the effects of all the industry stuff on PCU, uh, thinking if if maybe miners were not logged in, and we'll find out more about uh, what population is... Um, not here right now, uh, maybe after the economic report for June, which is coming out any day now. And then uh, finally, we talked about all the reasons that the PCU could be dropping and how they are overlapping and how everything kind of goes to that mid-May point. And there's a number of factors. We listed off like seven of those and all those things combined, uh, some of them natural, some of them force majeure, uh, are, are putting pressure on players uh, not logging in, plus the characteristics of the players that are logging in. We'll know more about that in the future. Uh, and so there you have it. And also we took a look at jump freighters and freighters. Oh, there are so few of them. And that is very interesting because that means when there's few of anything, that market can be cornered by somebody who decides to buy up everything and relist it for 20% more, that sort of thing. You got to watch out for that. Do we know what you're going to do now? I am not going to do that. <laughs> I've had enough of jump traders for a while. No, uh, we'll, we'll see. Who knows? Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Rav, for coming around and staying up. Really appreciate it. Kenneth, always a pleasure. Gregorin, Nick, and Shen, thank you guys for hanging out with us. And thank you, audience, for hanging, around, hanging out with us. Uh, we will see you next time on Talking in Stations.